in, uh, in, in my own style on, on, on the other type. And, and you can listen to it, uh, uh, to that droning, if, if, it, uh, if, it, if you find it uh, meaningful. Um, I'll try to enliven it, um, even in the absence of an audience. Um, OK, so here's some process suggestions. Um, I'm going to cover some of these in, in, with, with more comments and other things. First one, I think, is merely a comment. And I emphasized this earlier. When you find bugs, when you find defects in your model and oversights, use that as an opportunity to question your process. Use that as an opportunity to say, what was it that left us vulnerable to this first? What was it that allowed this problem to creep into the model? And secondly, how could I have found this faster? Why didn't I find this earlier? Not in a, you know, sort of self-flagellating sort of way, but you know, how could I do it even better? Now? How could I find this thing quicker? Um, how could I have nipped it in the bud, you know, shortly after it was introduced? These are a one important questions, and if you're only using the defects and bugs to change the model, to patch the model, you're missing a big opportunity. Use them to improve your process. So that's an exhortation that I don't think I'm going to go into more here, but it's arguably the most important one here. Um, okay, a second issue is peer review. Um, there is there's a huge body of literature that's been accumulated now on um, on software uh, quality assurance. Okay, building. Uh, improving the quality of, so of commercial software. There's a remarkable number of tools out there that are designed to improve the rigorousness with which we test software. And there's a whole science in the art of software testing that's emerged that's very powerful. But the single biggest gain for software quality assurance lies not in the testing, but in the peer review stage. And by peer review, I don't mean review of your peers. I, re I mean review of artifacts by your peers, by your, by your fellow colleagues. Um, and this can be done at any stage of, of model building. Um, it can be done when you're first thinking about a model conceptually. It can be done when you have a detailed design, but you haven't yet implemented it. It can be done in the final implementation. Um, so peer reviews is something we'll talk about. It's an industry best practice. Peer reviews can find defects, um, more defects, and defects more quickly than testing. They require less, peer review requires less time per defect found than testing, human time per defect found, and it can, can identify a larger fracture defect. That's what uh, the, that's what studies have suggested about inspections, uh, which, are, which are a formal type of peer review. Um, another issue is using tools for version control. It's really important when you build up models, you build them up incrementally to save away successive versions. The easiest way to do this is to literally save away version 1, version 2, version 3. The best way to do it is to have a version control mechanism, which is a formal software system to allow you to save away successive versions. Okay? Um, and that will document linkages between artifacts uh, to some degree as well. Um, there's uh, some further issues, uh, keeping careful track of experiments you've run and the results, uh, uh, the findings, so that when you have a later version of the model, you can go back to your notes and see if similar phenomena were experience for earlier versions of models to allow you to reproduce those earlier uh, experiments if you need to later. Um, the strive for ongoing process improvement is, is very closely related to the first point here. Um, focused prototypes, building a model that's focused to try out one particular strategy is really valuable. Don't feel you have to push everything together at once. You can build up a model to focus on one particular subcomponent see how it would work um, to figure out if you want to go that direction. There's some simple tests that can be used with any logic to test basic functionality. And this whole thing of integrating with other people's work frequently and in small steps is also very important. 
I'm just going to uh, talk about a couple of these. Oh, this is actually something that's really important that I feel I, I have done disservice by not um, listing it. This is a very important um, feature of any logic that you folks need to know about. You can create documentation for your model automatically within any logic. Okay? So if you right click on model and select create documentation, or you go up to the help menu within any logic, and you go to, um, excuse me, help, help create documentation. Um, hey, hey, where is it? Uh, tools, uh, create documentation. It was not in help, it's in tools. Um, you can get it to create a condensed documentation for your model that will take all this diffuse stuff you spread around the model. Oh, okay, you can't, yeah, yeah, because I did it before class and it's still got it open. Um, Ooh. Um, so, sorry, I just screwed something up in this code. Um, so, is satisfied? Well, okay, fine. Um, uh, so, you can do create documentation. It allows you to output in a variety of formats, and it will produce something like this. So, for example, it'll say for your main class, this is the startup code. Um, these are the salient features um, that that are used here, like should it auto create uh, data sets, um, uh, data set samples to keep for it, um, uh, et cetera. And I will try to, um, I have, I think I have it open in my um, editor here. Forgive me, let me just close it down. Um, yes, I want to save Salathe. Okay, no, then I won't save it. Um, fine. Um, Okay, let me let me just uh, close out any any version of it I have already open. No, okay. Um, yeah, you folks are probably gonna get to it before I will. Uh, create model documentation, um, and um, I'll just give it a different name here. This this is a very useful way of creating some documentation for your model. It's not complete. It's it's impoverished from the standpoint of a complete documentation, but it tells you a lot of salient features about the model. Um, so, for example, it summarizes the various parameters, the default value of those parameters, um, and uh, it uh, describes to you the various functions you've defined um, uh, as, as part of this model. So, really, it, it helps put together in one place the various things that are otherwise scattered around your model. And uh, that can be useful, not least because you can compare this documentation created at one stage of your modeling in another stage to, to assert sort of what's changed between them. So um, that you should know about. Okay, so, um, right. So I'm gonna talk now about a couple of these um, these principles. And in fact, there's, there's some which really should have been on that list earlier than are not. One of them that we talked about earlier, Bill was alluding to, is incremental delivery. Um, it's easy to get lost in these models. Focus on building them up incrementally. Um, innovate off of simple examples and, and avoid creating a big bang. Don't shoot for the big final model only. Create models with lots of pieces there. And there's lots of benefits for incremental delivery that are well documented in the software field. Uh, you get product soon, you get morale, you discover problems sooner, you get insights on where you want to go sooner adaptively. Um, you can uh, better estimate the time required to add additional features, um, and you know you can you can really get better hints about what to do when you're tangibly working with the produced artifact. So that's incremental delivery, creating successive versions that deliver value. There's a separate issue when you have a team project of what's called continuous integration. This is less of an issue for your projects because you're not working in large teams. If you're working in large teams, what you'll find is that you really want each member to contribute on an ongoing basis, like once a day, their, their updates, rather than each working on their components and trying to merge them together weeks from now. It's far, far easier to figure out what went wrong when integrating something if, it, if you've only changed small bits since the last time than it is if, if this is the result of integrating everyone's works over the period of weeks. 
it's much, much easier to find it if it's just they've, they've been incrementing it every, or they've been contributing every day. So all that's changed since last time is the last day's work. It, it makes it much easier to track down what's, what's this new bug that's in the system, et cetera. Um, uh, this helps support incremental delivery, but it's conceptually different. This is about, in a team context, how do you bring together the different pieces of it? And if you look up continuous integration online, you'll find that this is an idea that goes back uh, at least to the 1980s and has been a key enabler for uh, higher software development productivity and a key uh, uh, a way of avoiding some, some major problems uh, with traditional uh, techniques. So um, I don't have time to go into this more, but um, it's it's a strong, strong recommendation. If you work in a team context, try to bring together people's contributions frequently. Um, yeah, this uh, uh, ABM project generated large number of diversity related artifacts. These artifacts include model versions, documentation on why you built that version, scenarios that go along with the version, whole collections of scenarios that are conceptually similar in the sense that they may be a whole set of sensitivity analyses, or a whole set of intervention analyses, or a whole set of, of uh, extreme value tests, or a whole set of, um, of, of tests looking at, at alternative external conditions. And, and then there's results of those runs, and, and analysis of those runs, uh, either together or separate scenarios. And this, this can lead to a huge number of different uh, documents. And yet, it's important to coordinate the, the linkage between these things. And existing tools offer limited support for that coordination. So um, we have built a tool in, in my research group that, that allows you to keep track of these things and their cross linkages. In other words, keep track of a given model, model, ver model project, model version, uh, pro uh, versions within that project, scenarios run, uh, collections of scenarios, scenarios run, output from those scenarios, et cetera. Um, that's, that's valuable, um, but even if you were to just use, a, um, just use a version control mechanism to keep track of this stuff, it's very handy. Because if you can group this stuff in a version control mechanism, it allows you to go back, for example, to earlier versions of it and, and compare, and it allows you to copy earlier versions to later versions and adapt them, et cetera. So uh, keeping track of these, these artifacts in one place is very, very valuable. The danger here is that often, for example, in one set of Word documents, we'll mention what the assumptions were for certain runs of the model. And that's totally disconnected from the actual model version that was used with, you know, to actually make those runs. And if you store it in a version control system together with that model version, that, that linkage is more clear. So uh, we have a system called Silver which, which does this, but um, uh, again, I would, I would suggest at least being open to, um, to, these, uh, to these version control mechanisms. Um, okay, right. Um, so, so time is, is moving on here. Um, Testing, uh, so, so with software quality, there's a process known as testing. And testing is not just about finding bugs, it's identifying quality problems. Um, it, it's, it reflects uh, concern with general types of, uh, of understandability and comprehensibility of, of the model. And it's often where we encounter um, some understanding of, of, of issues uh, with the model design as well not just with the model implementation. So there's a set of tools um, out there to, to enable testing. And one of the most popular is called JUnit. This is a Java testing framework um, set of tools as well as, as classes that can be used to do testing against any logic models. Um, broad any logic testing is made more challenging by the need to create so-called test harnesses. Um, I want to create a, a set of slides on this, and I wasn't able to do it for this course, but I'll see if I can post a set of slides that show how JUnit can be applied to any logic. The suggestion here is you might want to create experiments within your model for focus testing. 
So rather than just having experiments that focus on baseline cases and interventions, for example, consider having experiments that are themselves extreme value tests or that, that test um, a model under some very controlled conditions to get basically verify that it's working properly. Um, and JUnit, as a framework, can moreover allow you to, to test sub-pieces of your model. Um, it can allow you to, to write some so-called test harnesses that will run tests on different pieces, um, pieces of your overall system um, to allow to test whether it's, it's working properly. Um, so you can create, for example, alternative startup logic in main that calls testing related method, uh, methods for when you're running these alternative experiments. And that could be quite, uh, quite useful. Um, this notion of prototypes is essentially, uh, sometimes we're building a model and we're not sure how we're going to undertake certain pieces of it. And you can create what's called in software development a spike prototype, which is a version, it's not a version of your entire model. It's, it's, a, it's a model which examines, its purpose in life is specifically to examine one particular feature that might make its way into your model. So you play around with that. You get a sense of its pros and cons before committing to put it into your actual model. Um, so throwaway prototypes, as they're sometimes called, are very valuable to reduce our uncertainty, reduce the risks, essentially, with going a certain direction. Um, so most commonly in software development, these are used for UIs, for user interfaces, graphical user interfaces. But, um, uh, they can be used uh, more broadly, uh, broadly in modeling. Um, okay, peer reviews is the thing I want to um, just note, uh, note in general. So there's some, there's some very interesting studies which have found that a uh, formal type of peer review called inspections, which have a very well-defined process associated with them, um, uh, can, can find bugs, uh, find errors, faults with an underlying program. Uh, at a remarkably rapid rate compared to uh, testing, compared to the human time required for testing. Um, it turns out that writing tests takes time. Writing t there are sometimes tests written to test tests. Um, there, are, uh, there are needs to, to modify tests over time to help them evolve with the system being tested. And in general, it can require a lot of effort. Um, peer review, it turns out, uh, it's been studied and it easily pays for itself in terms of the quality gains from it. In terms of the time reduced for debugging, for example, um, uh, caused by peer review, it's, it's, it's much more effective to put the time into, into peer reviews. And it's more flexible than testing um, because it, you don't have to wait for the final code. You can do a peer review on a conceptual model plan. You can do a peer review on a high level design of what the classes are in the model, how they'll interact what the state charts are in the model before implementing them. Um, how you'll go about implementing the queue of people awaiting transplants or what have you. You could give a high level description and have that inspected um, by colleagues. Um, so it turns out early reviews, doing these reviews earlier, um, really, really help um, in, in tracking down, down problems. And it turns out reviews have manifest benefits in other areas. So the people who review the artifact learn from the process. They, they learn about how this code works. They learn tips that they can apply for their own models. But they also learn something about how this particular model works so they can help out with the model in the future. The person whose artifact is being reviewed also learns. And there's general spread of knowledge about, about standards for building models or the code base more generally, et cetera. So people have, have uh, studied uh, peer reviews within the software process and defined different points where you can uh, apply these things. And I would argue there are several points in the modeling process as well. Now, I don't have time to go into guidelines for review, but I've included a, a number of slides here on this. Um, what I do want to highlight is, is this notion of inspections. Inspections involve a defined team of individuals focused on, on a review process where uh, items are circulated up front. Um, so there's documents uh, circulated before the review. Um, it's, it, it's at a planned time. And uh, people before the review will often check 
check against the model, take a look at the model, poke through it. And, um, and then uh, during the review, there'll be a set of, of, uh, uh, set of individuals, uh, participants, who have defined roles. So there's a moderator and an author role, but uh, there's uh, additional roles associated with, with readers, recorders, et cetera. Um, and uh, there's a, a formal inspection package that's created that, creates, uh, that includes the deliverable, standards and requirements that are, that are relevant, um, individual issues logs people can, can fill out when they're reviewing it, um, and work aids to sort of help identify defects, sort of the common problems that have been found in different versions of models, et cetera. So there's, there's often a couple meetings involved. Um, uh, the first meeting you know, will create an inspection summary report and issues log of things that need to be, to be resolved. It has a set of, of, of people in, in certain formal roles, so authorator, moderator, readers. Uh, there's a reader presents people the, the pieces of the code who's often not the author of the code. Um, the author is there, but not, not presenting it. And then there's inspectors and then recorders, et cetera. Um, generally speaking, there's rework that's needed after these. So people identify issues. And then after it, the author seeks to address the issues in the, uh, in the issues log. And sometimes uh, some of them get, get assigned to others to follow up. And then there's a follow up stage. Often it's conducted with just the moderators, the verifiers, sort of like what we do in academia with the, with the uh, professor, you know, um, giving, having the signing authority to make sure everyone's changes are incorporated in a, in a dissertation document. Um, but sometimes there's an extra verifier uh, as well. Um, and then there's processes which seek to use the findings from the review to improve the development process and the inspection process. How could we have found these things more effectively? How could we have found even more problems like this? Why didn't we find this bug until late in the session? Um, uh, you know, how did this um, how did this bug come about, and and what could we do to uh, to improve uh, to reduce the chance of that in the future? So, trying to identify the root cause of, of defects. So, um, software inspections are something which. To best of my knowledge, um, no one else has talked about it more. And it's only because I teach software engineering in addition to modeling that I'm so familiar with these. And we conduct these sort of uh, inspections in my group from time to time on models. And it invariably is a great learning experience for people. It spreads around a lot of knowledge and identifies real issues. And often with the group that we bring together, they um, you know, you could you can actually find key key things in the span of say two or three hours, um, and you really don't want to go uh, much beyond that. So inspection, I think, is an undervalued, underrecognized uh, tool that could be used to improve the quality of, of your products. It's not the only peer review uh, out there. There's a set, and unfortunately, I don't have it in these slides. There's a set of other peer review. Um, uh, there's a, there's a spectrum of formality for peer reviews that range from uh, what's called pair programming, which uh, I have advocated and practiced as something called pair modeling within this process. It involves two people working together on the same model, sitting next to each other. So one person may be on the keyboard, the other's looking at it and learning from it and commenting on it. And boy, is that good. Um, uh, and, and I don't care whether it's a professor and student or two students themselves. Uh, uh, if it's the professor and the keyboard and the student looking on, you almost invariably come up with insights from the other person being there. Insights that save time later. But more than that, it's not only that the quality is better after that, but the, um, you know, if the artifact that's produced, but both people go away with a richer understanding and, and go away with a deeper understanding of what's in the model uh, and, uh, and how to structure it better. So informal peer reviews like that, pair modeling, are really valuable. Um, another, another sort of peer review is what's called peer desk check. And, and that involves me coming to, you know, or coming to a colleague, or a student coming to a student, or a student to a professor, and saying, look, I've got this model here. Could you look at it? And this sector particularly, or this area, I'm not sure how to, how to handle this thing. Or what do you think about how I've done that? Can you see an obvious way to do it better? 
or you know, uh, uh, is is there uh, is there a, a more efficient way to to report these statistics or whatever? And that's an informal thing, not pre-scheduled, spontaneous, but it's uh, it is something which uh, you know can often bring a lot of insight. So peer reviews are very very important. I'm coming down now to uh, closing minutes. While I um, switch just to some uh, greatest hits of uh, best practices on the technical level, are there any questions about these best practices on the process?